<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Mary Alice Nebel, Professor Emeritus of Consumer Science and Retailing for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, January 27, 2009 in her home in West Lafayette. This is part two of the interview. Welcome to pick up where we left off. Okay. Um, I thought you wanted to talk about graduation, commencement, stuff like that. One of my favorite activities as um, a, a professor and as an administrator at Purdue was to work commencements. Um, for several years, I was the school marshal, and uh, maybe it's because I'm a Leo that I love doing it, and a lot of people had difficulty in, in even thinking about it. But I love to do this because it was an exciting time. When the students were uh, showing success, they were happy, their parents and families were happy, and it was just a really uplifting event. Um, when I was marshal for the school, um, it seemed like we always would um, march in on aisle six of the Hall of Music, and then we had to, as the word was, loop, so that you could have the students in alphabetical order, of course, so that they could exit to go up on the stage. And um, it was always a thrill, even when I hit my eye instead of my mortarboard to tip my hat to the, the dean. Um, I did that for several years, and then I was asked to be the assistant marshal for the entire commencement ceremony. And so I worked with Al Gerker, and, uh, who was the marshal, and it was our responsibility to line the students up in the armory. Um, and we always uh, read instructions to them, um, to the students. Uh, sometimes we had to worry about where the, the uh, school marshal was or the department marshal to come and, and to lead the students. But it was always a thrill. And, uh, but by the time four commencements was over on, in May, uh, one was tired because you had to be there um, an hour before the, they came to line up. Um, there were sometimes questions about why didn't I get a distinguished cord? Um, and you had to be able to um, answer that question for the student as well as for the marshal because sometimes they didn't know that. And I, it was difficult for students to understand that their second semester grades were compiled into that and even though their name was in the roster as having um, achieved distinguished status, uh, sometimes that last semester uh, maybe didn't uh, affected it so that it made it different. Uh, but there were questions like that that you had to answer, but it was always a thrill. And uh, you got to be friends with other uh, faculty members and um, they would always listen because one part of our script was follow your marshal. And <laughs> there were some that thought that that was really, you know, it got the students' attention. And uh, the students, of course, were not supposed to have things on their mortarboard. They were not supposed to wear anything around their neck other than the distinguished cords. Um, and so you had to look out for all sorts of things like that. But whether you walked because it was cold and slick down through the Hall of Music or whether you went around, and I always threatened when I was a school marshal that I was going to lead my students right through the fountain. <laughs> that one, but uh, obviously you don't do that. But uh, it, it was always a thrilling, thrilling ex experience. And uh, I served as the assistant marshal for the university um, for eight years, I think it was. And so it was a, th a thrill. And you made lots of good friends in, with people in offices that you didn't know that well before. Right. So good, good thing. And they do a, and of course it was uh, when President Baring came is when they he moved to the port. There's commencements in he May. He did. And, and August, December. In Dece December. And right. December. Right. And um, prior to that, if anyone was graduating in December, 
uh, or August, they had to wait and go through commencement the following May. And it was a great thing because this, uh, the students, most of them weren't going to come back and be able to experience that. Sometimes I know that um, students think, oh, they didn't want to sit through two hours or two and a half hours, but, and they couldn't understand you know, why it was only the president that was speaker and, you know, all of these questions. But once they went through the uh, ceremony, it was always a most positive response. Have they always given them a complimentary cut or they can buy a DVD or has that always been the case or? No, it has not always been the case. Um, I think that that was started, well, maybe right at near the end of Betty Sudarth's tenure, I think, um, because um, that was when they started taking pictures and so that the uh, students could have their picture with the, you know, as the dean handed them their uh, diploma. Uh, but, um, and then the DVDs uh, came along a little bit later, right. so they haven't always been... But prior to that, they would just get their the, the program that would be all would be. They would get the program, program, but they would also, and Purdue is unique, they would get their diploma. Oh yes, right. But I mean, there wasn't any the pictures and all those additional, no, no. you know, addende for one of a better no. term did not occur, and this is really nice. Mm -hmm. And also, in, and do you recall in the Hall of Music have they used, have they had the the TV screens up for all the time or? Um, or before, maybe that, I think that they were, mm -hmm. um, and that was to respond to those who wanted everybody's name called off, and if they had done that with all of the undergrads, this would have been, you know, an enormous length of program. But what they did was list all of the st of the undergraduate students. Certainly, they called the names of the. Uh, PhDs and of the master's students, but then the undergrads, their names were scrolled up on the screen. Yeah. So, but at least that a little bit of a personal touch. That's yeah. right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the uh, anniversary of your school, the 70th anniversary, which has already taken place, and you probably got another one in the offing, I would imagine. I haven't heard a word about it, but it should be. Okay. <laughs> uh, the 75th anniversary was an exciting time. Um, when they named the 75 diamonds uh, from the alums who um, had given to the school um, of their time, their talents, um, and who had had a major uh, impact on the school. Um, and it was amazing the number of people who came back. Um, I remember I was asked to sit with Tilly Radcliffe, who was my former office mate, and um, she and her husband and uh, one of our graduates um, and her husband came, but it was a thrilling time when those um, 75 diamonds were introduced. Um, CFS has a wonderful heritage and it has also um, wonderful promise for the future. And of course, um, when they, when the people who came back for the 75th, they were remembering it when they were here. But uh, those changes that have occurred have made it a, uh, oh, a wonderful school. Mm -hmm. And you had pictures taken, or uh, isn't there something on the wall for the deans? Um, or, or maybe not. I remember pe some people coming to the archives and looking up some pictures. They, that may have been for the book or something of that sort. I think it was for yeah, the book. Probably. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, the debris had, was very helpful in that case because they had some pictures that they could use. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we don't have a debris. We're sc we, we scanned the debris for what we have, you know. But, mm -hmm. And people are going to miss that because when, they alums, are. when alums came back, uh, oftentimes we would loan the debris and the exponent to the uh, the reunion class or the big class, 25th and whatever. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people would drop in and they like to look at the debris and they bring their wife or they look at the group pictures and say, well, I really changed a lot. So, because they, some had them, we used to get them as gifts, but a lot of the people just didn't keep them over time, you mm -hmm. know, so. 
It was really nice to have, and I'm sorry that we're not going to have any more. Me too. Uh, campus infrastructure, I mean, the, the changes have been, even in your building, the stone has changed a little bit, hasn't it? Interior, perhaps? Uh, uh, there have been lots of changes. Um, first of all, um, let's go to Matthews Hall, because when that was called um, H2, um, it housed art and design, and it housed C and T, and it housed um, education. I think it was part of education. Um, but then, when that was remodeled, and of course, art and design moved out, uh, and then um, they have an area in that building that is used for uh, a, a department that may be remodeling is taking place wherever on campus. Um, and extension, of course, has moved over, as has CFS development moved over to Matthews Hall. Um, and the design um, labs, the clothing design labs, um, are on, still on second floor there. Uh, Stone Hall has changed as well. Um, HTM uh, is, you know, of course, has much of um, first floor. Second floor is foods and nutrition. Third floor is sociology. Um, I was talking with someone the other day, since there's no longer a library. Um, you know, I was here long enough that I remember when the student council uh, negotiated to get a library in Stone Hall. And then to get it carpeted and various other uh, updates to it. Uh, and now, of course, as I understand it, half of it is anthropology. anthropology. And the other half is foods and nutrition, I think. I'm not sure. I'm I, not sure. I think that's what I heard. Um, our office in administration, uh, the dean's office is in the same place. But, um, you know, there have been changes in that respect as well. And um, with the student records that used to be kept in, in that office, and now those are out in the departments um, so that um, to make it more efficient uh, in helping the students. Right. So. Oh, okay, good. Um, camp, um, talk about campus life a little bit in the 70s and 80s, maybe 67. I was thinking time. about that. And, you know, it, uh, students change, but students remain the same. Um, and, you know, I can, in my position in, well, in the early 70s, I was teaching still. And then in the later 70s was when I moved uh, over to administration and to academic counseling. But um, the students were um, probably more conservative, but yet I can remember the um, sleep-ins that we had during various uh, eras. Um, but I think the bottom line is that the students were there to um, study, to get their degree, and to progress in the world and help themselves. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, whether I was an advisor for uh, one of the co-op houses uh, for several years, and um, you know, I can remember going to those uh, house meetings at, had to be after hours, and it was like it, they'd start at 10 o'clock, and sometimes I'd get home at 1 or 1.30 1 or 2, and finally they got smart and started moving them up to a, a decent hour uh, that uh, for themselves as well as for their advisor. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, you know, the, the connections and that students have, and, and all they have to do is contact an advisor, whether it be an academic advisor or in the dean of students office or wherever, and help is available for them. Mm -hmm. But sometimes students, you know, aren't aware of that. I think that, um, you know, I, when I was um, fact fellow at Woodhall, um, and there were lots of um, activities that you participated in, but 
You know, a lot of it, you were there for the students, but you also got to be friends with other FAC fellows that you met from across campus. But I, on the whole, I think that students are serious. Um, pr- uh, um, sometimes we think of, of schools as being party schools, and I don't think Purdue has ever been that. Um, and I, I don't know, with its heritage, I'm not sure that it ever will be. But um, I think the students are here to, to be proud, yeah. make long, Purdue proud. How long were you a FAC fellow? And you, you know, the FAC fellow program, I'm a FAC fellow at Tarkington, but I think it's changing be, because um, with the, the, it was so nice when the eating facilities were in the building and we used to go over, and um, there are some, uh, some people, and there are a lot of things that they used to have, some of the activities like the Winter Whispers they used to have and all, and all so those, act, there are other things, but many of the things that, that we experienced in Tarkington and before that I was in Meredith, um, don't, they don't have them anymore. They don't. No. And there's, there's not a good way as there was when the eating facilities were in the hall mm-hmm. where you were assigned because you could make arrangements to meet with the student and have dinner with them, have lunch with them, whatever, um, and just get to know them. And you could table hop so that you could you sure. didn't have to stay with one student all the time. And the RA would not always bring the same group, the ones that would be available. So right. that way you got to know more of them on the hall. But exactly. You know, right. But uh, I, when I was still an advi- a, a fact fellow, and I can't remember the last year I was. Well, I guess it was 2002. 2001-2002, and I knew that that was when, of course, the um, new eating uh, dining courts were being uh, put in, were were being initiated, and we knew that there wasn't going to be those same opportunities to get to know students. But, you know, I have wonderful memories of working with the, the student who, whether it was the a student who held that office, or whether it was a residential um, assistant, whatever, um, but they they really took seriously the to get the, have the students get to know the uh, fact fellow and vice versa. Right, it was it's a good program. We it we, was, we still enjoy it. It's just that we miss some of the things that you know, were had opportunity. Makes it a little bit more difficult now yes. because what do you do? Do you uh, meet them? That we, at the union or invite them for coffee or whatever? It's, I think it's much more difficult, and we've just not been able to uh, work in kind of a meal thing this year. It's just been, and Wiley is, but if you park at Tarkington, it's a very long walk, and there's no place to park really close to Wiley when you're going, you know, 5 o'clock mm-hmm. or something like that. Or as Tarkington, people would leave, and there was a spot, you go in that alley, or we could park behind, so that it was easier to park. We, couldn't park across the street because that was restricted only to the residents. Right. But in the back, there was always room, so it was mm-hmm. not a problem at all. Right. Um, how about any awards and honors? You want to make a couple comments on that? One that's hanging on the wall at Sagamore? <laughs> um, you might talk about your retirement session, which is where you got it, right? I, that's right. I did. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, and I had some wonderful colleagues who promoted my um, receiving awards. And uh, I, I know that that was on the original list. And I thought, I, I re- will still always remember the first award that I received was a teaching award. And that was in the time when the Mary L. Matthews, no, it wasn't the Mary L. Matthews Club. It was the Home Economics uh, Club, and they always had this big spring event, and it was a dessert. It was in, held in the North Ballroom, and they would um, give out various awards um, to faculty, but also to students as well. And I was a new faculty member. I didn't know anything about it, but I, had, I was recipient of the teaching award. I still have it someplace here in this house. Um, But I can remember walking up to to receive that. And, of course, that was then the um, beginning, I guess. And then the... um, hmm. 
not the Amico. What was the Europe? Standard Oil Award? Amico. The uh, and it was known. Standard Oil when I got it, oh. and uh, I was nominated for that, and um, I received that uh, Standard Oil Award. There were three of us who received it. Um, and I was always grateful for that. And I remember I had to write a paper about why I should, why I was chosen to receive this award. Um, After you'd received it, uh huh. <laughs> and uh, Robinson was the provost. Oh, and, and, when and he thing. he requested that we write this paper. I don't think I have a copy of it anymore. I hope not, because I'm not sure what I even wrote. But um, evidently, I had been nominated the year before, and but did not receive it. And then um, my major professor was on the faculty on the committee to select the recipient. And I remember, she didn't tell me that, you know, anything about it, but I remember she came down and, and chatted with me afterwards, you know, just to pass the time of day and visit. But uh, uh, then afterwards she told me that uh, about a student who was not from CFS, but had stood up and and um, so was instrumental in me getting that award. Um, I received the Mary L. Matthews Award, which is the school teaching award after that. And there, it was interesting because there were some people who thought, well, if you had received the Amico or the Standard Oil Award, you were not eligible for the Mary L. Matthews, which was established after the Standard Oil and after the Amico Award. And there were some faculty members that stood up and said, oh yes, you know, if you haven't received the Mary L. Matthews, then you should be eligible for it. So I received that as well. Um, then, um, let's see, I received um, oh, various awards, one from the um, Association of Women Students, which is no longer in existence, um, the Very Important Woman Award, and I always remember uh, Betty Nelson was the one who um, did the uh, announcement of it, and it, all of these awards were surprises, which makes them very, very special. But um, she was talking, and she had done her homework and found out that my first best friend was a, a neighbor by the name of Billie Jean Grippenstro. And so she even included that in the um, introduction uh, for that. Um, a personal touch. A personal touch is right. Um, the I received the Special Boilermaker Award in 1995. Um, and that, of course, is an alumni award. And um, when... Jack Carl came over and said, hear ye, hear ye, as the, um, you know, announcer, so to speak. Um, that was a, a neat experience as well. And uh, to be on the football field and, you know, see friends uh, at a distance. Um, I think probably the award that uh, it, it means not the most, but it really is up there near the top of, of meaning, is being uh, a part of the book of great teachers. And when I look at all of those names and I think, oh my gosh, because uh, that was a thrill. And that was, you know, from, uh, from the listing. Um, the Sagamore of the Wabash uh, was a total, total surprise as well, um, because, and evidently they um, received it the day of my retirement reception. I don't know when they had ordered it, but that was when it had come in, because I know they said, you can have it now for two minutes, but then you have to give it back, and so that they could have it framed for me, and, and so forth. But uh, that that is a... You know, who would have ever thought that, um, you know, she'd get a governor's award, so. And evidently now, the Sagamores are not given as much as they originally were, so I don't even know whether they give them anymore. He has given one to somebody, uh, maybe two, shortly after he had, I can't remember, somebody who had been involved in 
government for a long time and they were quite surprised because uh, I'm talking about Ms. Daniels, our current governor. Right. Prior to that, there had been some uh, information given out in the press that he was not going to be giving hardly any. There, he felt that there had been too many of them. And then this mm -hmm. this one came. There may have been another one, but I'm not real sure. But mm -hmm. he's, they've been giving... There's another award, which is quite nice. And you can also get a little pin with it. That's to distinguish who's your award. And okay. they're giving those uh, now, and, but and that comes from the governor too. It's just not the same as the SAG award, but it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a nice prestigious award. It it's is really nice. yes, and mm -hmm. that is as well is very uh -huh. good too. I remember going to um, Sam Conti received the Sagamore award, and I remember that he invited Carolyn and I to go with he and Peggy uh, to, and they had a, a dinner for him and and so forth and. That was the first time I had ever known anyone who had received a Sagamore. And so that was a thrill as you well. You can also receive more than one and uh, because of the different governors. You know, you That's might get true. one from Bay, you could get one from Urbana. And also there's no listing kept of all of them unless you just happen to know your friends because they don't publish. There is not a, there's not a list that exists for all the people that have gotten them. That's just the way it's worked out. It's interesting, though. That is people, interesting. And people like to check and... We've looked at them, you can't really do it. How Interesting. About, yeah. The deans that you served under, who was the dean when you came? The dean? dean when I, I came was Eva Goebel. Okay. And um, it was interesting because, and I can't remember whether I mentioned about how I was hired but, uh, the last time, but uh, um, Peggy Conti was head of the Department of Clothing and Textiles. And uh, she had heard that I was going to interview at Berea College. And so she's said, I want to talk with you. And so we did. She offered me a position. And this was before she had gone to Dean Goble to make all of the arrangements. But was she at Purdue at that time? No? Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, it was when I was finishing up my grad work, uh, graduate work. And um, so she had to go to Dean Goble to find out, you know, salary and rank and so forth. I was hired in as an assistant professor, which there were some, this was far long enough ago that there were some people that you didn't come in as an assistant professor. You came in as an instructor and you worked your way up. And so I was the first one in our department that came in as an assistant professor. And, you know, it was fine, but it was just a little bit different. Um, but Dean Goebel um, uh, was Dean, and uh, this is jumping a little bit, but at my retirement reception, I was talking with two friends from HTM, and I don't know what, we were chatting for a couple seconds, and it came up about uh, my, I don't know, something work at Purdue, and I, my teaching, and so forth, and, and uh they said something about who was Dean, and Eva Goble was right behind them. And she said, I hired her <laughs> into that position. In her loud voice, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. at that time, yes. Yeah. And it was, I still, Howard Adler and John Roussel were the two that were kind of okay. But um, then she retired as Dean, uh, and Norma Compton came. And actually, Norma was the dean when I received my uh, the Standard Oil Award. That doesn't sound right. Well, I, it must have been, okay. but um, because I remember that you know I she was the one who escorted me on stage and and so forth. And then um, after Norma, then was Don Felker. And uh, Don was the one who, well, let me go back a second. Norma was the, the dean that invited me to come, wanted me to come over to administration. And um, when she came back, when she received an honorary doctorate, um, and I went to the dinner and uh, we were talking and she said, uh, Mary Alice, how have you liked being in administration over in the academic counseling? 
and I told her that it had, you know, had been a, a treme- was a tremendous experience for me. And, um, and I, um, I don't know, went on to say something else. And then she came back to it and she said, you know, I'm the one that got you over there. And she was, there was no question. And so I realized that and I understood what she was saying to me. Um, then Don Felker came as Dean and um, he, uh, he was the one that I turned, what age would that have been when he came? 60? Anyway, they were, they had a, a no, 50, 50, I'm sorry. And um, they had, that was the day I had to take my car out to have it repaired. And I came in by the car that brought me over from the uh, garage. And I walked in, and it was my 50th birthday. There was a sign out on the front lawn that said, Honk and wish Mary Alice Niebold a happy 50th birthday. There were signs all along the corridor in Stone Hall. One of the, Dan Thiel was the development person at that time, although I don't think it was called development. But anyway, he took me by the hand and led me down the hall, and who should I run into coming in the opposite door from near Matthews was Dean Felker. And so here he, I'm sure he thought, what is with this woman? But um, he was a, a very kind um, dean, and he was the one who promoted me to uh, the assistant dean position. Um, he first, I was, I guess, director, and then, um, then later um, to um, assistant dean. Because I always remember when John Story um, had been asked to go get me and take me down to the dean's office and of course John didn't tell me what was going on and I had the foggiest notion so I had him to thank for that and then when he died John Story was the associate or well he was associate dean under Felker and then he was the um, acting dean for about a year and a half before Dennis Saviano Mm -hmm. came and um Dennis was um, from, of course, from Minnesota, and um, I always, I, I have always appreciated him as well. And I always remember at my retirement reception, and he had some words to say, of course, about me, and. Um, And I I can remember because he said, you know, he was a young dean coming in and he had decided that um, his, that I was to not uh, have any access to students on an academic advising uh, role, that I was totally supposed to be administrative. And he, I think he wrote, he said that, um, I had responded that I would quit because how else was I going to know what students were, how they were reacting, what their issues were, what we needed to help them with, and so forth. And uh, he said, as a young dean, he learned very quickly that, uh, you know, he (laughs) needed to respect this. Um, He's also the one that said, Mary Alice, I want an ambassador program. And... uh, we have, I think at that time, the only ambassador program was in the School of Agriculture because I know that we went, I went over and, you know, got, did my homework to get it developed. But I will never forget what I would stay late many evenings. And especially if I was working on a project and I was on a roll, I worked until I got it done. And that was how it happened with the ambassador program because I had, you know, I had gotten all the parts to it, but compiling it and making it so that it had some semblance of organization, I needed to do that. But I remember him stopping by my office door and saying, Mary Alice, it's time to go home. And I said, I will. I'm on a roll. Don't interrupt me. Just let me get this done. And so... 
Um, that was, and the ambassador program has grown and is a really strong program. And there are many other schools that have it too. So oh. see, I think probably everybody does now, I think. Well, I think that, you know, as I said, ag, um, I know, engineering you know, they was. were the first ones, and then it, it, then we were the next ones, and I know that uh, my colleagues, the other uh, counselors, Rita and Teresa and, and so forth, we would talk at our uh, counselors' meetings at Picada, and we would talk about our ambassador program and how we were using them, and, and other schools came right on board, yeah. and that was, <coughs> excuse me, all at about that same time. Right, so, yeah. and now you have ambassador programs, whether it be for even organizations. Right. And I know residence halls have ambassadors, and yeah. and it's tremendous. It gives the students an opportunity to serve their school to meet people that right. they wouldn't have that opportunity. Particularly, otherwise. particularly alumni. People come back as they participate at events and things of that sort, so they can interact with them. You know, mm -hmm. Various schools. So it's really it's a good program. It's an excellent program. Right. Um, are, do you, professional associations make any comment on that? Um, did you participate in? I, per office, uh, I offices? participated in professional organizations. Um, I was a member of INAFCS or the American. It used to be the American Home Economics Association. It has become <coughs> mainly for teachers. Uh, but there's a certain loyalty uh, about maintaining your membership, and I still maintain it as a uh, retiree, as a retired person. Um, I was also a member of NACADA, the National Advising um, Council for Academic Advisors. I can't even remember what it all stood for, but um, and we presented some. Um, Topics at, you know, at some of our regional meetings or state meetings, uh, and PACADA, the Purdue Academic, Academic Advising Association, was a um, really a program that um, I was. A, I'm a charter member, but I was not one who who um, was instrumental in getting it going. But it was a, a very valuable organization, and. Uh, those are the you know the professional ones. Sure. Um, I uh, still maintain membership in, uh, in Delta Kappa Gamma, which is for teachers. But uh, you know that it, it's a professional organization right. as well. All right. And the Picada should make for the record. The Picada archives are housed in the Archives and Special Collections. Great. They've been there for several, oh, quite a few years, and then they come periodically and add things and. Do things so mm -hmm. we're really glad to have them. Mm -hmm. um, retirement activities. <laughs> Your I favorite. don't know how I had time to work. <laughs> my favorite retirement activity. Oh my! Um, I'm historian in the Purdue Retirees Association, and uh, that has been kind of a neat experience. Um, I, of course get to know other retirees that I didn't have an opportunity to when I was working. And when I accepted being um, the historian, I said, what's involved in this? Oh, well, all you have to do is just, you know, this was when um, Velma Shanky had established the, um, it, it in the archives and had moved everything that we had uh, kept. And um, so, oh, there's not too much. You just add to it each year. And so then I, um, I decided that there had to be more to it than that. And so, you know, rather than having to dig back into the archives to see what a group did, of course, there is an annual report that is written by the president, but that's still a lengthy, lengthy, lengthy report. So I decided that I was going to summarize the activities um, of what has gone on in that year. And uh, that has met with a lot of uh, positive comments um, from other uh, retirees that have worked with the board and, and so forth. And, and it's, it's fun uh, to do that. 
Um, so I'm, I enjoy my uh, interaction with Pura. Um, I have been asked to be uh, president and I said thank you, but no thank you. I, um, I, I just, I, I like my historian position and we'll go from there. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway. Um, another activity, although it's not totally a retirement activity, uh, I started it in 1993. Um, so I started it nine years before I retired, and that was become a member of Kiwanis. Uh, and uh, I always remember my, the person who nominated me was Roy Johnson. And uh, when and I went to a, you know, a couple of meetings uh, with him, and with Camilla Lawson, and uh, I, when he asked me to become a member, and I said, well, how often does this meet? Oh, every Thursday, every week, and I said that I can't get away from the office that much, and the comment was, and I've, I have repeated this many, many, many times, was that you owe it to yourself, for one hour a week to, you know, be in uh, with this group, and it's a, a very positive, positive experience, and um, and I I'm glad that I accepted that offer. Right after I became a member of um, Kiwanis, um, Sam Postlewaite asked me to take charge of the Diaper a Kid Day. And this was a program that was started in 1988. And um, the diapers that are collected on that particular day that is designated as Diaper a Kid Day for Kiwanis, um, those diapers are given to the Women's Shelter, or now the DVIPP program. And um, when I first took over the role, they just brought diapers and put them in the back of who's ever van and well, took them down. Would they bring pampers or just pampers? Uh -huh. Not the cloth. No, not cloth. Had to be disposable. And um, it was fun to see these grandfathers walk in with di bags of diapers under their arms. And um, but I will never forget we you know, we're putting them in the vans. And I guess um, some money was accepted at that time. And so we went up to Osco's, now CVS, and um, we've worked with them all these years. And they give them to us at sale price. But uh, anyway, they started just throwing the bags of diapers into the van. And I said, you can't do that. I have to know how many diapers that we have given. Uh, and these two men rolled their eyes as if, oh, why did we ever ask her to be in charge of this? And, but now that is what all of them want to know is how many diapers have we given? And uh, since we had a diaper a kid day in October, I think it was, and we've given over 85,000 diapers in that period of time. Uh, when we could use Purdue, the backs of Purdue uh, athletic tickets, um, Osco's had buy one, get one free, and they, they acknowledged that for us, even though it was, you know, on one big sale. Um, that, so we got to double the number of diapers in those years. Of course, now that's not any longer done, but... Uh, but that was always... Is, it, is that just one day a year that they do it? Well, oh. it, it depends. Right. If um, but, I but call still, down... But oh, they still have it. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we, if I call down to Rita Schmirak uh, and say, do you need diapers? And if, if they do, then, you know, we have another diaper a kid day. That's very nice. It's, yeah. it's neat. Um, that brought about... An award with Kiwanis, uh, the Tablet of Honor Award, that they gave me about a year ago, as a matter of fact. Um, and it was because of my work with, uh, with Diaper Kid Day. 
and also my work with the uh, foundation, the Kiwanis, Lafayette Kiwanis Foundation Board. And um, so, anyway. That's very nice. And I was the first woman president of Kiwanis, of, of our Kiwanis Club, of the, of the Lafayette. And it was interesting because I was the first woman president of Kiwanis and Betty Nelson was the first woman president of Rotary, your two larger service organizations, and they were held by women. That's very nice, yes. How about um, see, uh, preservation? Make some comments on archiving. You think preservation, since being the historian, you, you value it's good to save it and have it in some semblance of order. <laughs> and that some semblance of order is very, very important so that you you know what you have so that you can find the information. Well, I think, uh, I remember when Velma came a couple of times, she, she worked with Sammy for the archives, right. and Sammy taught her some things about organizing, but she also had some ideas too because she worked with this material and you realize you, you sort of meet the two, but when you just don't turn things over. You need to have an idea, and I remember... Um, years ago and we had the Purdue Women's Club mm -hmm. and before we accepted that I made the suggestion they had a lot of duplicates such as your the annual booklets and things like that that people don't really need so they they spent time going through and realizing that a lot of those book duplicates could be tossed out so that's mm -hmm. what they did yes and, but they were very glad because otherwise it's like uh, a pan the pan Hellenic it moves from person to person and then you lose track because it's just kept in someone's home and there's a value in that because a lot of activities and things that existed a number of years ago don't exist anymore, but it's nice to know some of the activities that the club was involved in. And it's nice to know that, you know, the, the route that was taken to get up to that, uh, the, the end result. Um, I know um, also from a personal standpoint, I was asked to write the 40-year history for Kiwanis, they celebrated their 90th uh, birthday, and and their had, the last um, history that had been written was you know 40 years ago, mm -hmm. and at uh, their 50th uh, anniversary. And so, what I did was I took it from that time, and then built it up to the the present, and it was amazing because all that I had to go on was the newsletters, and fortunately the editors of the newsletters for most of that 40 years was a person who wrote so beautifully and uh, made it interesting. And I mean, I'd sit here at the kitchen table and I, you couldn't just skim it. You had to read all of this. But, you know, you needed to get that down. <laughs> And um, and so, you know, now I'm the historic one of the historians for that, went along with Bill Buffington, and we, I don't know, you know, I haven't been keeping copies of the newsletters because I just assumed that office. So, but it's very important to have that information, and and you know, to go back and if anyone um, like with CFS, I know that Mary Louise Foster has been asked a multitude of questions time and time and time again about the about CFS and you know its establishment development and so forth. Right. Um, you asked a little while ago about the dean when Dean Compton came that was when our school changed its name from home economics to consumer and family sciences and I can remember she was a dean who had lots of vision as to what it um, you know what it should be and could be. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it's uh, you've got a favorite Purdue tradition and an outstanding event that you'd like to share with us. Favorite Purdue tradition. Well, you know what? I think we've already talked about it because, it, well, there are, there are two. One is commencements. That was always a thrill to be a participant in that and you know, work with that. Um, another favorite, well, I guess there were three. Another favorite was Day on Campus. And Day on Campus, uh, it got so that when I would have called the meeting of all of the advisors in our school, 
and be just a, few, a short time before day on campus and and I would always introduce it with this is one of my favorite things uh, you know that's going on and here that's because you're working with new students who are thinking oh my gosh I'm going to Purdue and the parents are not wanting to let go but yet they have to and it's everybody is excited and uh, it it was always just a, a really very, neat experience very enjoyable very enjoyable right. and uh, the only thing that was not enjoyable and maybe that has changed now is being able to get students in courses when they came late in day on campus and they needed courses and they were full and so forth um, but that was my favorite time but I always remember the last couple of years one of the one of the advisors would always say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, Mary Alice, we know this is your favorite time of year." And so those two, uh, I, you know, here at the beginning day on campus and the end, and I guess it's not called day on campus anymore, no, is it? No, I don't even know what it's called. It's got about three or four words: student transition or something. And there's about three or four words. I've seen it, but it doesn't roll off the. My top of like my head. DOC. Right, exactly. Um, so you had the beginning and the end. at the end. That's right. And at the end. Right. And um, another tradition, and I think that that has always, you know, been a favorite, um, is football weekends. And uh, since, oh, in the, I don't know, in the last 17 years was when... Um, one of my cousins who graduated from Michigan State said, Girls, we should have this home and away thing. And um, so they come here when we when Michigan State comes and we go there when Mich when we play up at Michigan State. Um, and that has been a neat thing. And, you know, friends come every home football game. Um, and we started this tradition with another family of cousins from Iowa and um, this year, this last fall we went there um, the fall before 17 of them were here and we put them in the on the floor and you know, on air mattresses and in sleeping bags and cribs we and all found room, right we found room right. um, and, but that is always a thrill to to exactly. uh, Right. get everybody together. Okay. And now, if you're, any closing comments that you'd like to share? Anything that, or any questions that were not asked that you'd like to share with us? This morning, when I worked at the church, and I, I did not, I was on the interview committee uh, with the new secretary of our church, but I didn't know her. And um, so we were chatting to kind of get to know each other a little bit. And... Um, she said, uh, and you liked Purdue. And I said, Purdue was very kind and good to me. And I said, so I want to give back to Purdue. Uh, and I think that that's one of the reasons that I work and volunteer at the Vista Information Center is because then you can give back. Okay. That's it. Good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Interview. Thank you.